I've started a couple of businesses and uh, I never went to business school. I studied communications. I never worked in sales. And uh, when I started my first business, which is called Present Perfect, um, I was all alone in my laundry room. And I was like, yeah, I'm going to start a business. And until you have a client, you actually don't have a business. You have a hobby. So uh, I knew that it was important to find a client. Uh, now I'm working on my third business. We're raising money. Um, and the first thing that every serious investor that we want to work with is asking us, like, how many clients do you have? OK? So um, if you are a developer, you think that tech is the heart of your business. If you are a creative person, you think that creative is the heart of your business. But I would argue, and some people don't agree, but I stick to my guns, sales is the heart of your business. Sales is the motor of your business. If you don't have sales, you have a hobby, right? Okay, so um, the thing is, is that sometimes at the beginning, we can't hire a whole sales team, right? Who here has a sales team in their business? Okay, you're in the right workshop. Um, we have to be our salesperson at the beginning, and we didn't learn this, right? So what I want to share with you is what I learned. I learned it the hard way. And this is the best of the best. This is the expresso, the concentré, uh, the, 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 you know, the creme de la creme of what I learned in terms of selling. Now, just a bit of a caveat before. Um, my first business was a services business, okay? So a lot of what we're going to be talking about is B2B sales, okay? So this is not like e-commerce B2C sales, uh, that sort of thing. In any case, it's kind of the platform that does that for you if that's what your business. I'm talking about, uh, what's your business, for example? Okay, so it's a, it's a recruitment platform for big public employers, so you need to sign RATP. You need to sign the Minister of the Defense. Is that kind of what you're, right? Okay, so this is exactly the kind of sales that I'm talking about, when you need to find people that will listen to you and then sign paper and give you money. All right? So let's just talk a bit about sales at the beginning, because when I started to sell, I thought of sales like this, right? <laughs> You think of like this slick, fat guy who's trying to sell you a used car or a carpet or a mattress or a vacuum cleaner or something like this. Um, or maybe you think of something like this, right? In the art of the deal. And, and it just gets this bad rep, uh, sales. It has a bad reputation. And I feel like it's so unfortunate that the most important part of your business get such a bad reputation. Or maybe when you think of sales, you think of this. Nothing. I don't have any sales. I would like some sales, but I don't have any sales. Okay. So I would like us straight from the get-go to have a perspective of sales for what it really is. Sales is a noble job. Sales is a noble job. Sales is nothing more than giving people what they need. OK? So for your recruitment platform, do you think that the RATP could be recruiting better than they recruit today? Yes. Could your platform help them do that? Yes. Will it save them time, money, and stress? Yes. OK? So why on earth would you be nervous about calling them and say, hey, we should have coffee. You should take my meeting. OK? Sales is a noble job. It's giving people what they need, all right? It's not like, hey, you want to buy a car? No, this is, this, is, this is not the way that we do sales. So just take this out of your head straight away. So um, as you can tell, I'm not a French person. I'm a Canadian in Paris. And uh, sales gets a bad rap, but I feel like it gets a particularly bad rap in France, right? Because what are the good jobs in France? Engineering, that's a good job. Politics, that's a good job. Uh, what else are the good jobs in France? Fonctionnaire, haute administration. That's a good job. Okay? But let me tell you something. Sales is a freaking good job. When I learned how to sell, I started making a lot of money. 
right? And I love to make money. So in France, we don't talk about money, okay? But in this workshop, we do, all right? So sales is a noble job. It's what makes you money, it what creates jobs, okay? So it's a noble job. So let's learn the basics of how to do this noble job. So the way that we're gonna learn this is there are four things that I'm gonna teach you today and it really is the basics, 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 okay? It's the, let's start from the beginning. But when I learned these four things, in 30 days, I saw my turnover increase 30%, okay? 10% a day. No, 1% a day, sorry. <laughs> Sales, good, math, no. But uh, it, it really is the four things that when we learn how to do these things, you will see a difference in your business. Ready? Oh, who said that? Oh, there, okay, perfect. Here we go. So the four things I'm gonna teach. One, prospecting. For me, this was the hardest to learn, but I'm gonna teach you some concrete things that you can do to go from zero to one. So for me, you know, people always say, oh, the, the first million that you make in your business is the hardest to make. And I would disagree. I would say that the first euro that you make is the hardest to make. Going from zero to one is really hard, all right? Um, thank you. <laughs> so we're going to talk about how to do that. So the, how you can know that you're almost making it to one is you get a sales meeting, right? So we're going to talk about how to not mess up the sales meeting, how to do a good job on the sales meeting. And then we're going to talk about once you start to get a few sales meetings and you're like, oh, I have so many meetings, oh my God, how am I going to handle it all? We're going to talk about how to create and sustain a sales funnel. Does everyone understand what I mean by a funnel? An entonnoir, okay? Right? And then we're going to talk about the things that you can do with literally zero, zero euros. Right? So I assume that if you don't have a sales team, maybe you don't have a marketing and communications team either. Raise your hand if you have a marketing communications team. Okay, that's good. All right, good, good, good. All right, so we'll talk about the absolute basic, basic, basic of sales and marketing that you can do with only yourself and a Wi-Fi connection. Okay? Here we go. So, how to go from zero prospects to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, <laughs> many prospects. And it's really hard because this reminds me of when I was in my laundry room all by myself, like, yeah, I'm gonna create a business, okay? Um, and I had to start calling people to be like, hey, do you wanna be a client of my business? And I was terrified, I was absolutely terrified of this moment of, okay, but, uh, how many uh, clients uh, do you have? Be like, well, you would be the first. This is joke. Ooh. Okay. So uh, I was terrified of this. So that's why I feel like going from zero to one is maybe the hardest. But let's talk about two things that you can do to go from zero to one. The first one is using your network. And we're going to talk about how to exploit your network in order to create prospects and clients. And a lot of time people say, oh, I don't have a network. You do have a network. There's nobody in this room who doesn't have a network, okay? And then we're gonna talk about something that's called jacket theory. So for people who are not French, uh, jacket theory is la théorie de la veste. And a veste, a jacket in French, there's all kinds of weird expressions in French. Like if you don't show up for a meeting for someone in French, you've given them a rabbit. Or uh, if, you, if something tastes really good, it tastes like baby Jesus in velvet panties, right? Like these are some of the most hilarious expressions in French. And uh, la veste means that you've been rejected. It means that you, you have, you know, somebody has said, I'm not interested, or you're ugly, or something like this, okay? So we're gonna talk about jacket theory, which is how to use rejection in order to move forward. So let's talk about network first. In terms of networking, there are three rules to remember. The first one is inside out. Now, what does that mean, inside out? Inside out means that everybody has a network. Raise your hand if you have a mother and or a father. <laughs> Great, lots more hands, okay? So that means that you have a network. So in France, another thing that's weird is, I know you guys don't like to talk about failure, you don't like to talk about money, you talk about sex all the time, which is weird for a North American, but um, you don't like to talk about uh, 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 some things that I'm not used to, but, um, and also I know that there's this line a lot of the time between professional life and personal life, 
right? I feel like French people don't mix them as easily as American people mix them and Canadian people mix them. And if you want to go from zero to one, you're going to have to get comfortable with mixing, right? So um, what's your business, Mr. Jean Shirt? <laughs> it's um, conservation of, uh, of, uh, of movies and CDs. Cool. So conservation of like movies, old, new, and, and CDs and that sort of thing. On an online platform. Okay, that's cool. And who would you love to sign? Who's a client that you would love to sign them? Uh, no, a group uh, that could be sent to Haiti. Great, like a big one. A big one. 20th Century Fox. Yeah, for example. yeah, okay, good. Okay, so I, so afterwards, this is also a lesson in networking. This is rule number uh, two. But I know lots of people at 20th Century Fox. I also uh, have contacts at NBC Universal, so come talk to me after and we'll see if we can set something up, okay? But inside out is you see that your uncle's girlfriend knows someone on LinkedIn at 20th Century Fox, okay? What are you going to do? Right now, your network is this big, okay? Your network is you, your wife, your mom, your dad, your dog, your cousins, and your best friends, okay? You need to use what you have in order to start going out. So dad's brother's girlfriend knows so-and-so at 20th Century Fox. I'm going to ask my dad's brother. So do you think you could ask your girlfriend who knows this person on LinkedIn to introduce me? Okay. I feel awkward asking this because I don't have any clients for the moment. My website got made like five minutes ago. Okay. I'm feeling very insecure about all of this. Whatever. Just do it. Okay, so you have to use the network that you have in order to start building it out because guess what? If she says, yes, I'll take your meeting, then all of a sudden you have a prospect, right? And she is going to talk about this cool platform to other people and that's how we build our network inside out. Do you see what I mean? Okay, so um, in the beginning, you're going to have to call in some favors. In the beginning, you're going to have to use your personal network in order to start building your professional network and that's okay. Because people who network understand that sometimes it's the beginning, right? So uh, for this startup, we're raising money. It's the first time I've ever raised money. I had, a, uh, I had a meeting this morning, and she talked to me about my BP. And I was like, well, my blood pressure's fine. Thanks for asking. She's like, no, no, business plan. I was like, oh, business plan. Yeah, business plan, sure, right? So it was the beginning. I didn't know this language. I didn't know this lexic, but she knows entrepreneurs and she's no problem. Everyone's allowed to start off. Everyone's allowed to be at the beginning of their project. Okay. So go inside out. Secondly, the other way uh, to network is you have to be doing it all the time. All right. So I can guarantee you that there are, no matter what your business is, there are people who want to do business with you. There's one thing I can guarantee you, however, none of them live in your living room. Which means that you have to leave your house, you have to leave your office, you have to get out there if you are going to meet these people. All right? And the people that you're going to meet, it's not just to sell to them. You have to create a network. And a network is people that you want something from, but people that you can do things for people that you might employ one day, people that you might hire to freelance for you, people that you might, uh, you know, um, want to be office mates with or anything. You, there's no such thing as, um, what I'm trying to say is you network generously. This is the second rule. John F. Kennedy, who says, ask not what your country can do for you, but ask what you can do for your country, right? So when we network, and what's your name, uh, Mr. Jean Shirt? Charles. Charles, okay. So uh, nice to meet you, I'm Annabelle. Okay, so when Charles and I met, you can see that this is my reflex. This is my networking reflex. I want to know what you do, and then I'm going to scan my mental Rolodex to see what I can do to help you, all right? And so let's imagine that Charles gets a meeting with NBC, Universal, okay? Um, they're like, yeah, that's cool. We're interested in that, that sort of thing. It's going forward or whatever. How is Charles going to feel vis-a-vis -vis me? Grateful. Exactly. Grateful. 
right? And Charles is probably going to return the favor, right? If he doesn't return the favor, that means he's kind of a selfish dick, <laughs> and that's not somebody I want in my network anyway. So it's a perfect system. Do you see what I mean? OK? So when you meet each other, in order to develop your network, because network is everything. So the first business I started is called Present Perfect. It's a professional services business. And uh, up until today, there literally is not a single euro of turnover, we do more than a million euros, that can't be traced back to my network. Right? So our company is called Present Perfect, which is also the name of a tense in English. So like our Google rankings are the worst ever. I think we're on like the 75,000th page or something. Okay, So we have to have word of mouth. We have to have network. And that's such a powerful tool for signing your first clients. All right. So the first client is the hardest one to get. The second client is the second hardest to get. And once you get to about 10 or 11, you'll see that they start to talk and it gets easier. And then the best thing in the world happens. My two favorite words in the French language after open bar, appel entrant, right? Incoming calls, right? How did you hear about us? Oh, from so-and-so. Fantastic. Okay. So ask not what your network can do for you, ask what you can do for your network, right? So it's what can I do for you? Et si affinité, all right? So the third one is no bullshit. People who create businesses understand that network is a crucial and vital part of building a business. So people who network, they understand, right? It's like people who ride motorcycles. Do you ever see them in the streets of Paris? They ride motorcycles and they go by each other and they do this to each other, right? That's like, I see you, brother. Two wheels, two wheels, motorcycle, yeah, OK. Right? And it's the same with uh, networking. People who network understand. We know the rules. We know that we're not going to be friends. We're going to be in each other's network. We know that you're not going to invite me to your birthday party. right? But I can call you if I need something that has to do with, uh, I, like I want to meet Florence at TF1, and I see that you know her, I can give you a call. right? Just like I know that I can give so-and-so a call if I need a florist because she works in an events company, all right? So what, knowing that we have these kind of unspoken rules, when you call to ask something of your network, just make it a no bullshit ask. The amount of times that I've had people call me who are like, hi, Annabelle, how are you? I'm like, uh, good, who is this? Oh, it's um, Marianne, we met at that startup event like three years ago, you had the great presentation, how are your kids? I'm like, how many kids do I have, Marianne? Uh, 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 one, two, um, two? Yeah, two, right? I have three kids. I don't remember who you are. You have something to ask me. Just ask it. OK? This makes me mad. And this makes people who network mad, right? If she had called and said, Hi, my name is Marianne. We met three years ago. I'm sure you don't remember me because I didn't maintain the relationship at all. I'm really sorry, but I need a favor. Okay? I would probably be inclined to be like, okay, what is it? Okay? So be generous in your networking. If you need to make an ask, make it a no bullshit ask, right? Um, understand that whatever little network you have now, you have to exploit it no matter how small in order to grow it. Does that make sense? Absolutely. OK. And I'm here to tell you that this is an irrational fear. This is an irrational fear that is holding you back. And I had this fear all alone in my laundry room. I had a fantastic uh, network. I had, a, I had great contacts. I worked in politics before. And I wouldn't call them because I was terrified of this moment of, who is this again? Like, they don't remember me. I'm like, oh, my god, I'm a loser. I was afraid of feeling like a loser. Okay? But just know that humans are programmed to be this way. We are programmed to be risk averse, danger averse. Okay? Even if that danger won't kill you. Right? And so I thought to myself, OK, what can I do to get over this? And so I said, I'm going to give myself a quota of rejection to get every single day. I cannot leave my laundry room until I have been rejected three times. Okay? 
So, and I had the nanny until 6 o'clock. So I was like, okay, I have till 6 o'clock to get rejected three times. Trois vestes à pont. And so I start calling. Hi, I started this company. It's a consulting company and communications and presentations. And I was like, oh, yeah, that's fantastic. We loved working with you before. Great, let's have a meeting. I'll have my assistant set it up. I was like, oh. Well, that wasn't so bad. But I had to keep going until I got rejected. Okay? So I started calling more and more important people. And they're like, yeah, yeah, that seems great, great. We'll, uh, we'll have a meeting, no problem. I'm like, oh, crap. OK. So then I was like, instead of just calling people from my network, I'm going to start calling people that I would just like to work with. So uh, who do I want to work with? Well, I don't know. Let's call Chanel. So I start looking, nah, nah, nah. okay, find the number for like literally like the front desk at the head office of Chanel, which a billion salespeople must call like every day, okay? So I call, I'm like, hi, my name is Annabelle Roberts and I have a presentations company and I would like to speak to the director of training. And she was like, yeah, one moment, I'll pass you through. I was like, oh my God, what was I so afraid of? So then she passed me through and I pitch her and she's like, please don't call me ever again. And I was like, Fantastic. One. Check. Okay? So why give yourself a rejection quota? Because one, it forces you to maybe go a bit harder than you would go. Right? It puts you into Daft Punk mode. Harder, better, faster, stronger. Okay? Two, you'll find, so people who, st and, and since then, rejection theory, uh, la théorie de la veste, has actually been something that I've researched, that I'm writing a book on, okay? So we've done studies on it, we practice it at our agency, and uh, I find that people who practice rejection theory for, for the first time, for the first three months, roughly between 50 and 60% of what they were sure was going to be a rejection is actually an opportunity, okay? So the magic number is 30%. Keep practicing rejection theory until about 30% of what you were sure was going to be a rejection is actually an opportunity and the rest really was a rejection. That's how you know that you're pushing hard enough and that you're not t'es pas lourd en fait. All right? So, rejection quota. If you work in sales, you should give yourself a rejection quota of 3 a day and 2 on the weekend. Okay? Does everyone understand this? Now, that's the first thing you have to do to practice the jacket theory. The second thing is when you do get rejected, when the, you know, the director of training at Chanel says to me, please don't ever call me ever again, I'm happy because I'm filling my quota, right? I'm totally nailing my KPIs. This is great. Um, but I did get rejected, right? And so that's why the second thing you have to do is you have to choose a loser BFF, okay? Une copine de la lose, ou un copain de la lose. You have to choose a loser lover, a loser best friend. Somebody that when you fail, when you get rejected, when you call RATP and you're like, I have this amazing platform now. They're like, why, it, where did you get this number? What, why, why are you calling? Putain, ils startent à la con. Okay. Okay? So when that happens to you, you're like, yes, rejection quota filled. But at the same time, you are kind of like, oh, that stings. So that's why you need to have your loser lover who's going to celebrate your rejections. Their obligation, so for example, there's a member of my team here, uh, Joanne, uh, Camille, Jeremy. So they are my loser lovers. So when I get rejected, particularly violently, I'll send them a text. I'll be like, Phew, grosse veste de la part de Chanel. Hein? Right? And they'll send me back uh, Celine Dion, Gifs, like, you're the best. Oh, what a super loser you are. Keep losing, yeah, rejection forever, good job, okay? We even have a special uh, chant that we do to celebrate rejection at the office. You want to do it, guys? You ready? Okay. Very good, very good, yay! Very good, very good, yay! It's stupid, huh? <laughs> yeah, it's really stupid because this brings us to the last thing. So when I started studying rejection and I started studying these moments where you get rejected and you feel really bad about yourself, molecule per molecule, rejection is almost exactly the same emotion as embarrassment. They're almost exactly the same emotion. So when I learned that, I was like, oh, yes, cool. I'm going to be able to train my rejection muscles without damaging my brand or my reputation or anything like that, right? Because if you go too hard, people will be like, vendeur de tapis, okay? 
So, uh, so that's why at Present Perfect, we do all kinds of stuff to auto embarrass ourselves. We do laughter yoga, which is where this chant comes from, which is so stupid and ridiculous. But if you are ridiculous, then you take away the power from anyone else to make you feel ridiculous, right? And we do controlled ridiculousness, okay? So, um, I mean, like the first time I got my meeting with Chanel, I didn't do very good, very good yay, right? Like obviously this is something that you do in a controlled environment. Um, we also do a show called Mortified. Mortified is a show where you go on stage in front of hundreds of people in a theater and you read your teenage diary and poems. It's, it's absolutely embarrassing. It's mortifying, okay? But by doing this, everybody laughs and you come away from it and you're like, oh my God, that wasn't so bad, actually. I'm way stronger than I thought, okay? So three things to do in order to build up your rejection muscle because you're going to get rejected and your fear of rejection is holding you back. So take the power away from that completely irrational fear and give it to yourself and your sales team by practicing rejection theory, jacket theory, la théorie de la veste, okay? So give yourself a rejection quota. If you are trying to build your business, you should have three per day. Get rejected three per day. Can't, can't eat, can't sleep, can't have a coffee until you've been rejected three times, okay? Find yourself a loser lover, and copine de la lose, right? Make, make it your business partner or your team. When you get rejected, share it with them, and it's their responsibility to celebrate that rejection, okay? And find instances within your team to auto-embarrass yourself, right? If you don't have any idea, we are recruiting for Mortified. <laughs> we need people to read their poems and letters and teenage diaries on stage, so you can just see Kemi afterwards, because we are recruiting. When do we do it? In March or something? March. March, okay. Okay, is this clear? Questions, comments? I want to ask you a question. Yeah. The first part of your uh, theory makes sense, but is that not what you call a cold calling? It can be cold calling. I, for me, I only started cold calling when I couldn't get rejected, right? So I knew that I had to get rejected three times by six o'clock. When it was like five, I was like, okay, I'm going to start really going hard because I'm not getting rejected. So yeah, I cold called. Exactly. But that's not a French, it's not a French practice. In France, it's more formalized. Yeah. You go rather with emails, you mm. go rather with, I mean. Because they're all afraid. Sorry? Because they're afraid. Yeah, but, this afraid. Is the, but this is the French way. And when you actually call them, whether you speak French or English, they're very taken aback. The French are actually taken aback. Uh, and they say, well, you have the guts to call me. I mean, it's like almost how dare you. Mm -hmm. People just think you call me, you don't even know me. Mm -hmm. But that cold calling is very actually, is a sort of anglicized way of approaching your client. Mm -hmm. It doesn't really happen in France. And French people want to actually connect with you, but they're going to formalize it. Raise your hand if you know. agree with that. Okay, you have four people who agree with you. I would say that uh, sometimes it, yeah, French people are a bit averse to it, but this is how I sign clients all the time. Because you have the guts to do it the American way and the Canadian way. And so does my sales team. Exactly. Thomas is French. Because you train them. Yeah. I'll tell you something, I'm a sales guy. Believe me, the amount of emails that I get trying to you know, solicit like a response is, is amazing. I and believe I, you. They have, they have all my details. I yeah. don't even know who they have. Why don't they call me? They don't call me. Yeah. Until I call them. So this is a very valid point. What's your name? Uh, Prakash. Prakash. This is a very valid point, Prakash. And so, as I said, I'm writing a book about this. This is one slide when there is actually a book. But just to go a bit further, rejection quota has to be coupled with creativity. Okay? So when you are trying to get rejected, if you just do it, like if you just call someone up and be like, hey, want to do business? <laughs> okay? Of course you're going to get rejected, but you're also going to look like a huge a-hole. Right? So rejection quota have to be coupled with creativity. So for example, on the sixth time when the Chanel learning director did not take my call, I sent her a cactus with a bike coursier, with a bike messenger, and the cactus was delivered with a card that says, Je ne pique pas, vous savez, on peut boire un café? Okay? Which in English trans, what? Yeah. Okay? And so, yes, yes, Kemi, that my Kemi is like, yes, yes, and I actually do it all the time. It's kind of my trademark. Okay? Um, and so, uh, you know, it's true. And so thinking about that, which translates into for our non-Francophone office, I'm, I'm less prickly than this cactus, that's why you should accept my meeting. 
Okay? And so the fact that I did that still didn't get me the meeting. She's really a tough cookie to crack, but she did send me an SMS with a smiley face. Good. This is a fantastic idea. Okay. So um, one of the um, biggest VC capital uh, ventures in the Silicon Valley, Sequoia Capital, one of their founders talks about how he accepted a meeting once because a guy sent him a $50 Starbucks gift card and said, coffee is on me for the next three weeks if you accept my meeting. Okay. Right. And, and so he's like, yeah, sure. I'll accept your meeting. Okay, so paying 50 bucks for a meeting with the most important VC in the entire country, is it worth it? Yes. But you have to have a bit of brains and a bit of neurons. So this is a word that French people don't really like, but the word is cute. If you are cute, we're never, oh, probably not going to say no, right? So what's your business, Pratik? Uh, uh, Prakash. Prakash, sorry. Uh, telecommunication and basically an app on an IT as well. Very, uh, all on SaaS related, but I do, I do all configuration to this one today, work with BBB and BBG. Okay, so if somebody sends you a completely standard email, Mr. So-and-so, I would like a minute of your time to explain that, you'll be like, next, right? It depends what's in the email, to be honest. I, I wouldn't just, if it really got like a sort of, uh, uh, you know, if it's uh, pertinent to my business, it's got the relevance to my business, I would look at it. But what I get is they want to actually network for me. They want to bring me clients. They want to go and source clients for me. But they don't even have a clue of what my business is all about. Right. How do they do that? Right. Okay. So um, because uh, I knew this lady, because I had followed her on Instagram, I knew that she loved cactuses. So if somebody is sending um, an email and they're just like, uh, hi, just want to talk to you about so and so and so. And then in brackets after, you're just like, by the way, your turtleneck is so Steve Jobs loving it okay it's like Steve Jobs meets George Clooney meets well, great okay hoping we can have coffee take care bye-bye right so the, the, at the very worst we're gonna get a smile maybe you'll go look at this LinkedIn page like who is this weirdo woman okay at the very best you'll be like Steve Jobs George Clooney I have 15 minutes okay so rejection quota has to be coupled with creativity which will force you to think about a new way of doing it Okay, so I'm going to move on because we don't have a ton of time, but is this clear to everyone? <coughs> okay, so once you get the sales meeting, all right, once you get the sales meeting, three things that I'm going to suggest. One, start the conversation and then shut up, all right? So this is particularly hard for me because when I'm nervous, I'm chatty, right? When I'm nervous, I'm chatty. Um, and so this was hard for me to learn and I just want to pitch what I'm doing and talk about how great it is and we have the best UI and you're going to love us and think. No. I generally now tend to start with something like, hi, thanks so much uh, for taking my meeting. So this might be a weird question, but um, why did you accept my meeting? She's like, because you prospected me and sent me a freaking cactus. Okay. I'd be like, I know, but you must get prospected all the time, every day, all the time. Why me? Why this meeting? So this all of a sudden opens up the whole conversation and she starts to talk. And she starts to explain her needs. And she starts to explain her motivations. And she starts to explain where this is coming from. Right? Time is money. You can make more money, you can't make more time. If somebody is giving you time, I feel like it's sometimes even more valuable than them giving you money. Why are they willing to give you this time? So find your own version of this question and you will see that the floodgates will open for information. And every time you hear some sort of pain expressed, straight away you're going to lift, you're going to push your eyebrows together like this and say, huh, oh, that's interesting, tell me more. Okay? Can we all just practice that? Just put your eyebrows together like this. Hmm, that's interesting, tell me more. Yeah. You do it really well, miss. Yeah. Like, hmm. okay. Okay? So every time there's any kind of pain expressed, boom, you're going to want to know more about that, right? Because if you can alleviate pain, oh, we want to work with you. Any kind of personal win that you can interpret, now this is very important. Pains, ask about them. Personal wins, don't ask about them. Personal wins are, what can I, how does this person win? 
All right, how does this person win? For example, um, what, what motivates them? What could happen in order for them to have a win in their life? So for this lady at Chanel, for example, and actually it's a guy now that we're in contact with, the guy at Chanel. He's not the decision maker, but his opinion is really valued in the team. So when I talk to him, I have to kind of understand how can he win. So if he's not the decision maker, he wins if his boss says, so and so, you really know how to find interesting and creative contractors. Good job, good job. Là, vous veillez, vous trouvez des prestats intéressants, c'est super, bravo. Okay? That's how he wins. That's how he feels like, hmm, great. All right? At the beginning of my career, I didn't pay attention to this. So when I would go on my first meeting, it was with, some, with a very, very senior executive at a huge uh, telecoms corporation in France. And I was talking about training and different trainings that we would do. And I was like, and you'll see that we really are the most competitive in the market in terms of pricing. And but for me, because I was a poor, starving startup -er lady whose you know, unemployment insurance had just run out, like this was a big deal to me. Like, yeah, yeah, we're really cheap. You'll see. Like, of course. Right? I wasn't paying attention to his personal win. And I made another comment about it again. And then he just gave me an absolute lesson. He said to me, in French, oui, très bien, mais de toute façon, je regarde pas des dépenses en dessous d'un million d'euros. Which in English means, yeah, fine, but I don't look at any kind of expenses unless they're more than a million euros. And I was like, oh my God, not the same world, okay? Um, but I learned that you need to read what's important to this person. If pricing isn't important to them, don't talk about pricing, okay? If, uh, how does this person win? Is it the prestige of being the most innovative in the company by finding the coolest new platform? Is it by the boss who says to them, oh, Jean-Francois, you are such a good employee. It's very good. You find this. It's very good. Okay. Is it by just having a quick fix now? <coughs> Sometimes I'll go on a meeting and I'll sell 45,000 euros of training in 10 minutes. Why? Because I need it to work. I need it to be good. I heard about you from so-and-so. Done. Does that make sense, everyone? Questions, comments, desires to express yourself? No? Okay. And then third, and very important, you need to ask a question in the meeting that will help you understand what success looks like for them and how they're going to measure that success, right? So what's your business, uh, sir? I work with Charles on this uh, preservation and distribution platform. Okay, fantastic. So you're, let's imagine that you get the meeting with uh, NBC Universal, right? Mm -hmm. You're listening, yeah, okay, right, our digitalization, our digital transformation maybe could be going a bit faster, not, and you're writing everything down, like a mofo. You write everything, okay, because you don't know what's going to be important later. Write everything down. And you're going to say, okay, fantastic. So let, let's imagine that we work together. We would love it, but we're not there yet, but let's imagine that we work together. And six months in, you are absolutely thrilled with how things are going. It's going exactly how you want. Describe that scenario to me. What's going on? Okay? So you're putting them in the future where everything is good and they're going to tell you exactly what you need to do in order for them to be so happy. Does that make sense? Yeah, we do actually do that a lot with good. a lot of prospects. The, yeah. the actual issue we face with is we do it again and again and again because you've got to do it to 25 different people. Like yes. You never know who actually has any say. Yes. It's simpler in an organization like GF1. It's a mess in an organization like NBCU or, or Canal Plus. So. Yeah, 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 absolutely. That's but the other. I, I mean, finding out the real pains and real benefits is not that difficult, mm -hmm. but actually getting in negotiation mode is, is, is you know, it, when it happens, it's usually a bad accident by chance. Okay, so so hit, if, in case but everyone. You have created the conditions for chance. That's the valid point. Okay, so in case everyone didn't hear what uh, Charles's business partner just said, what's your name? Jean, in case everybody didn't hear what, Je what Jean just said, he said, finding pain pains is pretty easy. And it is. All you have to do is put your eyebrows together like this and say, oh, that's interesting. Tell me more. Okay? Or, so why, why, why isn't your current solution working out exactly as you planned? Okay? That's easy. But then, finding projected success and also, right, and how are you going to measure that this is a success? What are your KPIs for success? You need to ask that question in the meeting. And then, closing the deal, is that what I'm hearing from you, John? is a bit harder. Is that what I'm hearing? Actually closing the deal and getting into negotiations is a bit harder. Actually getting to the point where you're actually discussing a deal. Okay, so let's talk about that now. 
What you're going to do is, as soon as you come out of this meeting, in the meeting, you're not going to talk about price unless you feel like price is going to be a problem, right? So I was in a meeting the other day, and they're talking about this whole 360 solution, nah, 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 and they're just like, and we have a pretty generous training budget this year. We have 11,000 euros. I was like, ding, 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 shit, okay? That's, that's not a lot of money. That's not, this is going to cost way, way more than that. So since there is an alarm bell, I'll say something, right? So at which point I was like, fantastic. Um, just to let you know before we go, Present Perfect is not the least expensive date that you can go on. We are the prettiest and the best in bed, but we're not the cheapest option out there, right? So just for what we talked about, you should be looking at about 80K. So I'll make the proposal for you if this number is not a deal breaker. And she's like, no, no, it's a deal breaker. I was like, okay, have a nice life, okay? Um, but what you're going to do after this meeting is you're going to go back and you're going to write a recap email. And the way that you write your recap email is really important. When I learned how to write my recap emails like this, this was the clincher to really getting further into the sales funnel. First thing you're going to do is you're going to have an opening line, which is what we call same but different. So there's a researcher at INSEAD. His name is Noah Askin. And he created an algorithm that can predict if a pop song is going to be a hit or not, which is both depressing and fascinating. But uh, the way that he explains it in his TED Talk is by saying that a, a song is going to be a hit if it's close enough to the songs of the moment that we know and love so that we don't feel lost when we listen to it and new and fresh enough that we feel like it's cool and interesting. If it's really new and fresh, even if this artist is incredibly talented, it won't work, right? So this is what same but different means, which means that most emails start with, hello, suite à notre échange par téléphone machin, or uh, suite à notre rencontre, je vous fais les récapulatifs. So after our meeting, let me just detail what it is that we talked about. Uh, hope you're well. Nah, nah, nah. This is how most start. Same but different, I want you to, what was the most cool, quirky, interesting part of your meeting? And this is going to be your opening line. What was the most interesting thing you saw in this person's office? What was the most non-business related thing that you talked about? This is going to be your opening line. Okay? So opening line would be something like, uh, Hello, I'm writing this message from my country house in Bretagne. I saw on your Instagram that you uh, also, have a mess, uh, also have a house on the Côte de Granit Rose in Lagnon. Uh, so cool. Uh, did you know that DSK just bought a house in that town? <laughs> okay, which is true. Um, they, they would be like, that's a very odd thing to say, but that makes me smile. That's funny. Okay. If you're in the massage business, that's an opportunity. Absolutely. Jean says if you're in the massage business, that you're going to see a boost in sales. Okay, so that's, that's not nice, John. All right, so, um, all right, so choose the same but different opening line. Everybody opens with, Bonjour, merci pour votre temps, uh, mercredi uh, 13 décembre. Suite à notre échange, je vous fais le récapulatif de... <coughs> that's super professional, okay? But guess what? This person has a thousand super professionals in their life. <laughs> you're the young startupper. You're allowed to be a bit cool, a bit hip, and break that mold a little bit. Okay, so same but different opening line. Afterwards, you're going to say, at the end of your meeting, sorry, we're back in the meeting now, you're going to say, great, this is all fantastic. I will put a proposal together for you that really fits your needs. But just before, I'm going to write you a recap email. It's going to be a bit long, but it's really important for me to make sure that I've understood your needs. So I'll send you that recap email in the next 24 hours. Just confirm to me if I've understood. They'll be like, yeah, yeah. Okay. So you're going to send this recap email, and the first part is what I've understood of your situation. And you're going to write down everything that you are writing in your book. Okay? Lots of your phrases en français vont commencer par que. Right? So there, a lot of them are going to start with the word that. So I've understood that NBC uh, has boosted its budget in terms of digital transformation. I've also understood that there's a real um, tendency right now towards vintage, towards 80s films that people are really wanting to appreciate more and more. And uh, I've completely understood your pain that you don't necessarily just want to sell this to Netflix right away. You'd like a, a different option, that sort of thing. So you, everything that you understood, okay? You're not proposing solutions. You're just showing the client that you've understood their needs and you've heard them, okay? So you can add a bit of industry knowledge 
to interpret what you've heard in this part of the email, but don't start going into, that's why we think our solution would be perfect for you. Mm -mm. Show them you've understood, show them you've listened, show them you understand their business, show them you understand their pains, okay? Uh, if they call it um, a, a, a digital reel, well, for you, it's a platform. What's the name of your company? Noma Lab. Noma Lab, okay? So for you, it's the Noma platform, but they call it the, the digital real thing. Guess what? You call it the digital real thing, all right? So there's a client at Present Perfect today who has bought so much training who calls the training by the wrong name. This is not the name of the training, but they just think this is the name of the training, so that's what we call it with that client, and it's very confusing. Okay, but they are happy and every time I try and correct them I'm like so you want to do the so-and-so method They're like no, 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 we want the other one I'm like okay Okay, so is that clear to everyone and then you're gonna say how Noma lab can help or how Noma lab can uh, You know be of assistance or anything like that and then what you're gonna say is you're gonna have a little part of Noma lab is a, an innovative startup in blah just one blurb explaining who it is that you are and then, based on their pains, you're going to suggest only the solution that fits with their needs, and you're going to do feature, benefit, prove it. Okay? Feature, benefit, prove it. Which means feature what Noma Lab does, benefit what Noma Lab does for you, prove it, an example, a shining example where this already was the case. Is that clear? Okay. And in the shining example that already was the case, you're going to say, and the client uh, described increased, and what you say after that is the response to this question. Right? So if their projected success was NBC is perceived as a more digital brand and perceived as more modern, in this part you say, and so Noma Lab does blah blah blah, benefit what this means for you, okay? Prove it, so-and-so went through this uh, and they're really happy. Um, we saw increased modernity in the brand image and blah, blah, blah. Only if it's true, we never lie. Is that clear? Okay. So all of a sudden when the client reads this, they feel listened to, they feel understood, and they feel like, huh, that thing he talked about really does what we needed to do. All right. And never in the history of since I've been doing this has there ever been a client who's come back to me and said, Miss Roberts, you're kind of cheeky because you just said the words that I said in the meeting in your mail. No, but I have had many dozens of emails where people say, I've never had a recap that has made me feel so understood. Well done. All right. Questions, comments? All right. The last thing here is, the last part of our email is next steps to take. And in the next steps to take, you're going to propose what we call an MVA, a minimum viable action. Minimum viable action means you ask them to do something. All right? So the, the thing I ask them to do every single time is to say, now, it's very important to me that you get back to me and confirm that I have properly understood your needs. If not, we're starting off on a false basis, and I won't be able to give you exactly what you need. So please send me an email with your notes. Have I missed or misunderstood anything? If they're not even willing to do this, put them on the back burner. Okay? When I see a client who returns my email with, yes, my comments in red, and they've read it and they put comments out, I'm like, good, this is going to go further. This is great. Okay? So sales is nothing else but getting to N-O as quick as possible getting to rejection as quick as possible. And if they're not even too willing to return the email with their comments and say, yes, Jean, you have understood. You and Charles are geniuses. Okay? If they're not willing to get back to you with even this, not serious. Go get more rejection. Go look somewhere else. Yeah? Mm. You wouldn't try to keep up with this client? Of course I would. I would keep up with this client, but there's only 24 hours in a day. And so I have to know where do I prioritize my energies. So what would be a time lapse? Depends on, depends on the interesting factor of the prospect. So how can we know how interesting the prospect is? Okay, this is a good question. 
Very simple. We're just going to give them a score. That's it. Okay? So determine three things that make for a fantastic client. Right? Um, let's take a new example. What's your business, sir? I'm working for a company that is providing digital learning tools. Digital learning tools. Okay. So if you call Chanel, she's really hard to reach. That's the first <laughs> thing. Okay. Second, um, what's your ideal client? A school. A school. Let's say Harvard University. Okay. All right. So in the beginning, prestigious clients bring you more clients, right? So let's say I want to get a meeting with Harvard. So the three things that make you decide what's a good prospect is one, notoriety of the brand, right? Because prestigious clients beget prestigious clients. Two, money, right? If they're nickeling and diming you, if they're like, oh no, it's too expensive, negotiate, 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 and then you do business with them and they don't pay, this is awful, right? So let's say money. And then three criteria to know if it's a strong prospect, if it's worth spending my time and energy on. One, they're prestigious. Two, they have budget. Three, they're in a very digital phase right now, so in need of my solution. So what you're going to do is you're going to give this prospect a score from negative five to positive five in each of these criteria. Okay? Harvard Business School. One, no notoriety, positive five. Two, Money, let's say that they're like, yes, of course, that's fine. F let's say four, okay? And then digital transformation, well, they did all of that like seven years ago. So they're like, good, we'll keep you on the radar. We don't have anyone in France for the moment, but uh, yeah, that's great. So I would say like negative five, right? So all of a sudden we arrive at what we call an ideal client criteria, ICC, ideal client criteria. We have an ideal client criteria score of... 5 plus 4 plus negative 4. What does that equal? 5. <coughs> 4. 5 or 4? Five. 5. Thank you. Okay. Equals 5. Out of a possible points of 15. Okay. So the, the client, client criteria at Present Perfect, which is a professional services firm, is 1. Urgency of the need. I don't just want to make money. I want to make money now. Okay. 1. Urgency of the need. 2. Budget. Or we say relationship to money. Okay? And three, niceness. I don't want to work with an asshole ever. All right? So these are our ideal cri cri client criteria. At the beginning, it was notoriety. But now I've slept with all the hot girls, so it's okay. All right? So um, let's take a client like, who's a good client? Guerlain is a, is a wonderful client. We love them. Um, urgency of the need, when they call, it's for now. Five. Money, they pay. They don't negotiate, they pay on time. Fantastic. Three, niceness, they're so nice. Not only do they do business with us, but they send us free perfume after, which is amazing, right? And then when I wanted to actually buy the perfume for myself, I was like, $100? I was kind of shocked, actually. Okay, so uh, they have a perfect client score, 15, right? Let's take another client who I'm not going to name because that's not very nice, but we fired them, okay? We fired them. Um, they didn't pay, they were mean and nasty, um, and they would always like string us along. Oh yeah, maybe in a few months, I don't know. <whistles> Ciao. Mm -hmm. All right? So I would say at seven or eight, it starts to be interesting. Spend your time and energy in anything that's over a seven or an eight. Nourish the relationship a bit between zero and seven, and don't spend any time and energy on anything that is below zero. Does that answer your question? Okay. All right. Cool. So this is the recap email. Let's talk about managing <coughs> all of this information that you're going to start to have. If you don't already have a CRM, the basic cheap ones that we like to use that I suggest for startups, they don't pay me to do this. I just really genuinely like the product, is uh, Evelise <coughs> for making bills and quotes and having an eye on your turnover and that sort of stuff. They're a fantastic uh, French startup. Uh, based out of Lyon, I think. Um, just really nice guys that make a really good product and they will answer the phone if you call. If you have a problem, it's like, yeah, hi, can I help you? Yes, Evelise. Like, they're just really nice and it's cheap and it works. Yeah? B2B or B2C. Works for both. Okay? And then when it comes to managing all of your different prospects and everything, we like to use Pipedrive. Uh, it's cheap, 
It's intuitive. It's fantastic. Uh, Why not say it's intuitive? Oh, I love it. Once so, you know it, it becomes intuitive. But the, 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 you know. The actually, I would agree with that, Jean. Yeah, I would agree. That's a valid point. Once you know it, it's intuitive. I agree. <laughs> I agree. It's, true for everything, it's like true for everything, but but yeah. Once you get into it, it really is great. Okay. It's apparently simple. It's actually not simple. Then it gets simple. <laughs> that, I would agree with that. If you think it's simple, but then you're like, oh crap, this is not simple. But then you're like, oh yeah, actually it's simple. And you can lose stuff easily if you're not careful. <laughs> if you're not careful, you can lose stuff. This is true. But just be careful. And I would suggest that you do the onboarding process that they recommend. They, they tell you to watch a bunch of webinars and stuff. And at the beginning, I was like, I don't need to watch that. And then I was like, oh crap, maybe I should watch that. Okay. And then I watched it, and it was better. Okay. Up. Now let's talk about managing a sales funnel. I love sales funnels. I think that they are so beautiful. Like I could look at a beautiful waterfall landscape, and sometimes I'll look at my sales funnel, and I'm like, God, that's more beautiful. Okay? But only if it's in good health, right? So look at the way that a sales funnel is shaped. Um, if your sales funnel is shaped like this or like this, like if your sales funnel looks pregnant, I'm going to say a bad word. So if anybody is like Mormon, just plug your ears, you're going to get what we call funnel fucked. Okay? And this is bad. All right? This will mess with your life if you get funnel fucked. Okay. So let's talk about how to manage a sales funnel. When it comes to B2B, um, a sales funnel is going to have, I like to have it in five steps. Okay? And your job is to push people along the funnel as fast as possible. Right? Always remembering that your job is to furnish what they need, and that's all. You can't push people down the sales funnel if they don't need what you need. If you're doing that, then you are the used car salesman, salesman that we saw at the beginning of the presentation. Okay? So, um, the first part is the world. The world is very, very big. This is the very top of your sales funnel. This is anybody that you think would like to do business with you. All right? This is uh, the Walt Disney Company for you. This is uh, La Banque de France for you. Okay? Um, this is uh, HEC for you. <coughs> Okay. Oh yeah, I think they would like to do business with me. So you put them in the world. And then you prospect them, right? In the world, you're going to get rejected all the time, right? Your copine de la luz, it's going to be like a hotline. Okay. Um, and you're just going to keep going and keep going until someone gives you the time of day, until someone responds to you. All right? Now, I like to s consider that no is a response. Right? Uh, do you have a question? No? Okay. I like to consider that no is a response. Has anyone ever been to Montmartre and then you walk down the stairs and there's those guys at the bottom of the stairs that want to make a bracelet for you? And the tourists, does everyone know what I'm talking about? And the tourists are they're like, oh yeah, you want a bracelet? They're like, oh yeah, sure, I'd love a bracelet. And they say I'm like 15 euros. What? Okay. Those guys, even when I'm like, no, I don't want a bracelet, they're like, oh yes, she answered me. I'm going to keep going and I'm going to keep harassing her. Okay. I'm kind of like that guy. Because, <laughs> because when, uh, you know, when I call uh, someone and I'm just like, hi, you have no idea who I am, but I run this fun company. We're pink. We're in the middle of Paris. We'd love to do business with you. I know this is a random cold call, but I'm not a weirdo. I'm, I'm actually kind of fun and cool. Would you like to have coffee and talk about learning 15 minutes? That's it, right? And they're just like, well, um, no, I, I, I'm in a meeting. Uh, can you call me later? I'm in a meeting, can you call me later, means please don't call ever again, right? But for me, I'm like, great, the next day. <laughs> I like send a message, I'm like, hi, it's the pink girl. Uh, are you in a meeting? Can I give you a call? Right? And at this point, she's not going to break her behavior pattern and be like, never talk to me, you weirdo. Right? So for me, that's a response. So I'll keep going. Okay? Or maybe the response is, sounds cool, let's have coffee. So that's when, bing, you're going to put them here. And you're going to put alerts for yourself for the actions so that you don't forget anything. So when you get the meeting, and in the beginning, I would tell you to always go to a physical meeting, right? So now I've been doing this for a while. I can tell what should be a phone meeting, what should be a Skype, what should be a, just an SMS exchange, what should be a physical meeting, okay? But in the beginning, I'm going to advise you to always go to a physical meeting, right? 
And this is needs analysis. And that's when you're going to listen to the client, you're going to do the recap email, you're going to ask the questions about the KPIs, all that stuff that we learned. You pige me? Okay. After that, you're going to do the recap email, and if they want to go further, this famous negotiation stage that Jean and uh, Charles were talking about, um, that's when you're going to make a formal proposal that includes things like <coughs> pricing, um, potential applications that are specific to the client, right? Stuff that you actually took time and effort personalizing for this client. Okay? And then after that, once you close them, you are going to farm the heck out of them, right? Farming a client, because right now what you're doing is you're hunting. You're hunting, right? Like, ooh, can I catch a beast? Ooh, can I catch a bear? Right? Once you've caught it, now you've got to farm this client, because the best new client to get is an old client. And if you're working with NBC France, you're going to farm this and recycle it to work with NBC UK, NBC US. Okay, now Universal. Great, Universal Music. Even though I think they're different groups now. I'm not sure. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and we don't want them. <laughs> you don't want them. Okay. Fair enough. ICC. No fucking way, he says. Okay. All right. Does this make sense? So the way that you, and we call it virus. If you do business with one part of the company, then say, Oh, I see that uh, so-and-so, can I, can I have their email? They're like, yeah, sure. All right. So when we worked with Guerlain, I was like, oh, can I have the phone number for the lady who manages all the learning for LVMH, the 70 uh, Maison? She was like, oh, yeah, sure, Annabelle. Here's Jennifer. Here you go. All right. This is called farming and virus. All right. Any questions about this? Yeah? How do you deal with the case of where whereby you do not want to make a proposal because you know the proposal is going to be used for another purpose, like renegotiation with the existing supplier. Ah, the question was, what do you do in the instance where you go to the meeting, they ask for a proposal, but you don't want to make a proposal because you know that it's just going to be used to negotiate against another supplier or that sort of thing, okay? Yeah. Um, I vote for transparency in this case. Uh, it's happened to me before where I said like, oh, okay, great, let's make a proposal. And I went, got back on the phone to her the next day and I was like, hi, so-and-so. I'm like, écoutez, je suis vraiment embêté. I'm really in a pickle here because I think if we're completely honest with each other, we're probably not going to do business together. Am I right? She was like, mais comment ça? I'm like, look. I know uh, that you're in talks with so-and-so. I know that so-and-so, blah, blah, blah. So it's going to represent about six hours of my time to do this proposal for you. Um, I've made an abridged version that I've put, I'm going to put in, a, um, in an attachment to this mail. Um, you know, but if you, if you really are serious about us doing business together, we can absolutely renegotiate, uh, reopen the negotiations. But uh, you know, for the moment, I'm a startup, I have limited resources, I have to be careful where I spend my time. And that's not mean, mm -hmm. you know, it's assertive. And people respond well to that. People think that no, N-O in sales is a bad word, it's not. It's an assertive word. It's a word that teaches people how to treat you. Does that answer your question? Yeah? yeah but there's one thing about the French way of doing business, you never say no. That's not true. They say no to me all the time. You know, what I get is, I like what you have, I want to, but I don't have the budget. I have to get a budget for that. And then you keep hunting, you keep hunting, you keep hunting, and they keep being evasive. They don't get to closing a deal, and you still keep going at it. Then don't spend your time and energy there. Use the ICC, right? So if it's important for you to do business now, and not just plant seeds and see what will grow, then make urgency one of your ICC criteria. So somebody who does this to me is going to score maybe negative three, negative four in the ICC. So that's how I'm going to know to stop spending my time and energy there. And uh, if, they're be if they're being like that to you, then just say no to them. Just be like, you know what, F fantastic. Um, we, as a general policy, don't negotiate our prices. So if you want to come back to me when you have more budget, you know where I live. And uh, I hope we'll get the chance to do business together. OK? All right. Is this clear? OK. So just a, one tip per cycle of the sales funnel. World, use the jacket theory. Use la théorie de la veste. Use your rejection quota. 
When you're in the world and you're trying to get people to give you the time of day to answer to you, use your rejection quota. Make it a game. Make it a game. Every time you get rejected, your copine de la lose, your loser lover, sends you the funniest gif they can find. Okay? Take the sting out of it. In terms of response, one tip that I'm going to give you is be so darned accommodating at this stage. Right? So if you're getting married on April 23rd and they're like, oh my gosh, I wish you had called us before. We just had this one meeting that we have for on April 23rd, the CEO is going to decide. You'd be like, great, I'll be there. Okay? No problem. So at this stage, you need to be so amazingly accommodating. At this stage, remember what we learned about the needs part. Asking about the KPIs, asking about projected success, pushing your eyebrows together and be like, oh, that's interesting. Why is that? Oh, okay. Oh, yeah, great. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Okay. Everything we learned about needs analysis. In the proposal, this is where we're going to go into staffing and pricing. Because to be honest, once we get all the way here and the budget is maybe higher than we were thinking, we don't want to, how do we say, feel like we've wasted all this time up until here, right? Unless here in the meeting, they're just like, look, I'm just going to tell you right from the start, price is our main, our main issue. Like if you can do it cheaper than the guy who's doing it now, it's great. It's for you, okay? And then here in the farming part, just be a freaking pleasure to work with. Just be a pleasure. Just be an absolute delight, an absolute delight. Okay? So when we have a so-and-so from ex-client that I'm not going to name that Joanne knows very well who calls us for the fourth time to change music that she chose in a film for the fourth time, which means we have to redo it all over again, we're just like, okay, we understand. The right music is really important for the film. No problem. Just so that you know, we're out of billable hours. So if you want to change the music again, it's going to cost 600 euros, but we're happy to do it for you. Just be a pleasure to work with. All right? Last thing, free marketing. Coco Chanel said, the best things in life are free. The second best are extremely expensive. Okay? And the best things in life are free is true for marketing and communications as well. The best thing that you can have in marketing communications is word of mouth, authentic viral buzz, people who talk about you at a dinner or an event. Okay? So I would advise you just to do two things. One, I want you to know the 10 journalists who can make a difference in your life. If you know the 10 journalists who, if they talk about you, it will make a difference in your life, that is very important. And you're going to cultivate those relationships. Okay? So the 10 journalists who can make a difference in your life, you treat this like the bat phone. Okay? You only call when there's real news and you cultivate the relationship before. So in, in terms of a journalist, you're going to do 15 things for them and then ask them one thing. Okay? So you follow them on Twitter, LinkedIn, every social media you can imagine. And when you see like, oh, looking for someone who loves uh, wireless headphones to do a story, you're the first one to answer, oh yeah, my brother, he has every kind of wireless headphone. He's available for an interview. Here's his number. Okay? And your brother's like, dude. <laughs> okay? So do you need to know who they are. And then after that, speaking gigs, take them all. If you're doing less than a million euros in turnover, every opportunity that you have to speak in public about what makes you special, what you're an expert on, do it. Find out where you can speak. Okay? Conferences are happening all the time. One time I got asked by this conference called Web Today in Nantes. Does anyone know this conference? They asked me to speak, and I was like, what is that? I'm like, it's in Bretagne. No, I'm not going. And my communications lady was like, shut up. You're going. Here's your ticket. I was like, Pff. So I went, and we, it actually generated a ton of business. Who knew that there was business to be had? Dans les régions. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> I'm just joking. Um, but it actually generated a ton of business. So you never know. Get out there. Get yourself out there. OK? So this is basically all I have to say about sales. Uh, if you have any questions, comments, desires to express yourself. But once I learned all this stuff, I was just on my way and on my bike. And that's why I like to share it with other companies and share it with other startups.
Ouais, yeah, go, go, go. Merci beaucoup à tous. Euh, N'hésitez pas à nous faire des feedbacks et tout sur le, sur le workshop. Je suis dispo sur Slack. Je suis Florence au Media Lab TF1. Voilà, n'hésitez pas à, à nous faire des feedbacks sur euh, ce que vous avez aimé, moins aimé. On te, les, on te, le, on te le fera pas. Ok, merci Florence. Merci beaucoup. Bonne journée. Merci. Thank you. On, on vous souhaite plein plein de vestes. Euh, Annabelle L. S. Robert. C'est un L. Mal écrit, <rire> mal dessiné. J'ai juste une petite question. Euh, là, en fait, euh, 